Okay, good afternoon. Um, okay, before I get started on my presentation today, I uh, just want to share a bit about my background. Um, I work mostly with adult patients with medical, uh, different medical conditions, which include cancer. And um, I, a mother of two, I, when my son was younger, he had some medical condition and went through surgery and rehabilitation. And uh, unfortunately, my mom had uh, lung cancer, so I was also a primary caregiver. So through this uh, journey, in um, so-called life journey and experiences, um, I've learned uh, to, be, uh, to make things more practical. So in my sharing today, um, uh, a lot of the suggestions are also um, through my experience, uh, some are personal, some are from my patient, adult patient, some are from uh, children patient, but they don't have cancer, but they have other conditions that may have uh, treatment side effect, like uh, nausea, vomiting, that you will also see in uh, cancer condition. So I tried to put them all together to make it more uh, practical and uh, more useful in that context, okay? All right, um, I am not able to stay long after the talk today because I have an evening uh, event to attend to. So if you have questions after the talk, you can contact me by email. My email here is on the slides here. Okay, and uh, towards the end, I'll also flash a uh, slide with our contact number. So for people who need to consult dietitian, uh, you can uh, call us to arrange for an appointment. But we do need a referral from the doctor. So you do need a letter from the doctor uh, written to the attention of the dietitian so that we know uh, what condition you have and uh, how we are able to uh, best help you in terms of nutritional advice. Okay? All right. Okay. So uh, just briefly, what I'm going to run through today is um, I'll first start off to uh, touch a little bit about why uh, adequate nutrition is important. And then after that, I'll talk about uh, just briefly about um, why uh, the nutrients are important in terms of uh, cancer risk reduction and also to just in general to support uh, growth and development and to support a healthy immune system. Then I'll spend a bit more time to talk a little bit, uh, talk more on how to achieve the adequate nutrition in, uh, during difficult times, okay, in, uh, in terms of how to manage and cope with the medical condition. Okay. Uh, lastly, just some myths about uh, cancer and nutrition and some of the uh, frequently asked questions that we had. Okay. Now, um, you all hear about good nutrition. We know good nutrition is important for health. Okay? But good nutrition is not uh, enough because when we talk about nutrition, it's not just about good, the quantity, it's also about the quality. Okay? So it's both the good nutrition and adequate nutrition. Okay? Now, adequate nutrition means that you're getting all the nutrients, vitamins, minerals that are necessary for uh, the body functioning in order to support uh, growth in, and development uh, specifically in children, okay? And also to support and build a strong, uh, healthy immune system, okay? So in um, patients with cancer, not just children, but also in adults, uh, adequacy in terms of the nutrient is especially important because um, you do need uh, this nutrient uh, in children to uh, make sure that they grow and develop, okay? and in adults to maintain that uh, functioning and their energy level, and also to repair uh, tissue that may have been damaged, and also for maintenance. Because um, uh, if you don't get, if a person don't get enough uh, and adequate nutrition, that can lead to malnutrition. Okay. Now, oftentimes in children with cancer or adults who have cancer or those chronic uh, disease conditions, uh, they oftentimes they may experience poor appetite. Just like when uh, you and I, when we fall sick, we don't have appetite to eat. Okay? So for people or children who have uh, long-term medical condition, okay, poor appetite can lead to uh, inadequate intake 
in the long run. Okay? When they don't eat enough, they don't get the nourishment, they will feel weak, and then um, they will experience weight loss. Now, when they don't eat enough, where do the, uh, our body turn to to get nutrition? They'll start to break down muscle. So when a person experiences muscle weight loss, they feel tired. Yeah? And um, muscle wasting um, can uh, eventually lead to malnutrition. And that can actually affect the treatment outcome, okay? especially in children. Any amount of weight loss can be detrimental. Okay. For adults, we lose one kilo, two kilo. Okay. We are able to regain it quite fast. Okay. But for, uh, for the little one, uh, even half a kilo of weight loss can be quite uh, detrimental. Okay. So um, for us nutrition um, dietitians who work in a hospital, um, our priority when we work with patients is to make sure uh, that they don't lose weight and we also want to prevent the early development of malnutrition. So that is always our priority. Okay? But of course, um, every person is different, every patient is different, every child is different, they have different nutritional needs, and we also need to work alongside with them to help them go through this journey and make sure they get enough nutrition. So it's not always the case whereby um, uh, we say, okay, you need to eat five servings of um, the protein foods, okay? but they may not always be able to achieve that. If they can do halfway, that is better than uh, not doing anything at all. Okay? So when we talk about nutrition, the first thing that comes to uh, people's mind in the context of uh, cancer is that, oh, you only need superfood. Okay? You need uh, antioxidant, all these to help you uh, fight the cancer. But in actual fact, it is not just about superfood because this um, food, yes, it does contain uh, antioxidant nutrients that have uh, anti-cancer uh, property, those cancer-fighting property, but uh, they alone are not sufficient to uh, meet the nutritional requirement. So you still need the protein, you still need your carbohydrate, you need a little bit of fat, you need the vitamins and minerals. Okay? So in that context, it is all about healthy diet. Okay? Um, I won't spend time to talk about this uh, data here because I think uh, earlier on, Dr. Ansem Lee mentioned about uh, childhood cancer. Okay? Um, for Cancer in general, it does take a long time to develop. Okay? So a lot of these statistics where they talk about uh, how many percent in terms of um, the, from diet perspective, okay? um, what are the percentage that will um, result in cancer? That means if your diet is not healthy, okay, it can lead to cancer. Uh, it's about 30%. Okay? But in childhood cancer, it may not be related to uh, nutrition at all, okay? okay? So if a child is diagnosed with cancer, like what Dr. Ansem Lee mentioned, okay, it's not about the mother's diet. Okay? Sometimes if it happens, we um, just have to walk along with the patient and uh, help them and make sure they're able to cope with the condition and uh, for dietitian, we make sure that they get enough nourishment. Okay. So for us dietitian, uh, in practice, we have many tools that we use. Uh, we gather a lot of information from our patient uh, to find out what they eat, how much they eat, uh, what type of food, so that then we can uh, correctly assess okay, what type of advice, a specific advice that we can give them. Okay. But as a caregiver, just in general, how can you know or how do you know that um, your uh, loved one is eating enough? So what we use, something very, very basic. You may have already seen this, uh, my healthy plate. Okay. This is actually a, a visual guide developed by the Health Promotion Board to guide a general uh, person uh, on how to achieve a so-called balanced diet. Okay? So we use this just roughly as a gauge okay, to do a quick check to see whether 
uh, the person is getting enough uh, so-called nutrition, whether it's balanced. Okay? So you can see that there are different serving sizes by the age group, but this is not cast in stone. It doesn't mean that if, like, let's say, a child who is three-year-old diagnosed with cancer, they must eat this much. Okay? Sometimes they may only need uh, fewer than this recommended serving because it all depends on the child's uh, condition, the body size, the weight, and um, how much improvement they need to make. Okay? So this is just a rough guide to gauge in terms of uh, quantity. Now, in terms of quality, uh, that is when that's what our job is. Okay, we we really probe into like what exactly does the person eat. So, if a patient like come and tell me, "Oh, I eat yong tau fu," okay, then my next question is, "What is in your yong tau fu?" Okay, you may be surprised that sometimes they say their yong tau fu is all just fish ball. Okay, sometimes it can be a mixture of vegetable with tofu, then with um, another type of uh, root vegetable that have the fish paste inside. Okay? So the different combination and the type of food that is consumed will make a difference. And that can tell us in terms of the diet quality. And that's where, with all this information, we can then uh, give the patient a better guidance in terms of uh, what changes they need to make and how they can improve the nutritional quality of the diet. Okay? Now, even for fruits and vegetables, um, we look at the different variety from the different color group because uh, from the different color groups, uh, fruits and vegetables, first of all, they are rich in uh, vitamins, minerals. They are also rich in uh, antioxidant and phytochemicals. And these are components inside food that can have anti-cancer fighting property. Okay. So, um, when we probe and ask questions, we will also ask, what type of fruits and vegetables do you eat? Okay. And if the person says, oh yes, I eat fruit, I eat your two servings of fruits and uh, two servings of vegetables every day. But when you probe further, if they tell you, I only eat apple, no skin. Okay. And for vegetable, I only eat tauge and cucumber. Okay, then the nutritional quality, I mean in terms of the diet quality, is a problem. Okay? That is how we identify then what to, uh, how to prioritize, um, what to focus on, what changes is more immediate. Because okay? during cancer, uh, uh, not only that, okay? so uh, in children, okay, apart from looking at the adequacy and uh, the quality of the diet, we also need to address uh, the different nutritional concerns that are common uh, for a child who has no medical condition. Okay? Like for example, school-going go children, it's common to see that um, calcium intake may be a problem, but if a child has cancer, going through treatment, they can't eat, um, the priority then is to get the child to eat, okay, to help them get enough nutrition. And it will not be uh, getting enough calcium uh, may not be my so-called top priority. It may be my second priority. Okay. So um, prioritizing what is important, what changes to make, is like a uh, zigzag puzzle to us. Okay. But we cannot do this without the support of the caregiver. Okay? Uh, for children, when they're still young, sometimes they may not understand why they need to eat more or eat a certain type of foods. So it requires a bit of coaxing. And at the same time, um, we get better compliance if we get the child involved. Okay? It's part of the uh, normal parenting. When you want the child to... Um, to be able to listen to you, okay? No matter how you explain, sometimes they just don't understand, okay? So the best way to get them learn or to comply is to get them involved in what you're doing. So for nutrition-wise, uh, we get children, okay, uh, in the decision-making, if they are suitable at that age, to let them choose what they like 
um, then uh, get the parent to do a bit of storytelling. So our job as a dietitian when working with children, patient, is not just about nutrition. So there's a little bit of like parenting, a bit of education as well. Okay. So um, during treatment, okay, commonly what we see in um, cancer treatment is that a child will experience uh, poor appetite for many reasons. Okay? Uh, but the primary reason is due to side effect of medication and the treatment. Sometimes it's just the hospital environment. Okay? The environment makes them feel like they lose appetite. Sometimes it's the smell. Sometimes it's because they are uh, cooped up indoor all the time. Um, Sometimes it is due to um, other reasons like nausea, vomiting that makes them lose their appetite. Okay? So in this kind of scenario, uh, what can a caregiver do? Okay? Um, so our general advice is to, um, even for adults, I mean these are advice are applicable to adults as well, is to just have a small frequent meal, so snacks, but because the amount that they eat is uh, maybe very little at any given point in time, so it's important that the choice of food uh, consumed is uh, nutrient dense. Okay? For example, if a child can only eat about half a cup okay, of the food, of any food, so between a choice of like, I want a jelly versus uh, a cup of ice cream. For parents, usually we think of like, oh, these are all sugar, no good. Okay? So when we, between these two choices, which one would you choose that are more nutrient dense? Yeah, right. Okay, yeah, uh, on one way closer to become a nutritionist. <laughs> I think with the uh, technology nowadays, with internet, you have so much access to information that um, many people, okay, they can learn nutrition through the internet. Okay? So what makes us stand out a bit more as dietitian is our practice, okay, to make it practical and to be able to help uh, patients manage their condition. Okay? So in this context, uh, between a jelly and an ice cream, then of course ice cream is uh, so-called uh, more nutrient dense because it gives a bit more energy, a bit more fat, because that helps uh, provide that nourishment. And at the same time, uh, ice cream, if it's made from uh, milk sauce, then it gives a bit more calcium as compared to uh, jelly. Okay? Right. Then um, we do allow uh, favorite food. Okay? Commonly what we see, um, not in my practice, because I don't usually work with children with cancer, but I work with like fussy eaters, I uh, work with children who are overweight. Sometimes uh, they have food allergy. And in adult, uh, they also have poor appetite. So um, allowing favorite food is uh, one of the, our approach. Okay? Many times we see um, in children that I work with, uh, the parent uh, do not want to allow the favorite food because of the perception that the favorite food is not nutritious. It's like too fattening. Like for example, French fries. Okay? Uh, when we say, okay, McDonald's is a no-no, but in this case, if a child has cancer, okay, we need to balance the choice. You know, what is practical? What is ideal? Okay? What is the priority? So sometimes McDonald's is okay, okay? but uh, if McDonald's is the only food that the child will eat, then of course uh, we will have to start to uh, let them, the goal is to get them to eat first. Okay? then slowly work on what is a better option to replace the choice, okay? You never hear dietitians say, okay to eat McDonald's, right? <laughs> Not promoting for McDonald's, but that is a common fast food, unfortunately, okay? Um, appetite stimulant, okay, this is a medicine to help stimulate appetite. This is only pers uh, prescribed if it's only uh, indicated. Okay, doctor will decide when it is uh, suitable uh, to prescribe appetite stimulant. Okay, uh, what we see in adult, uh, the appetite stimulant actually doesn't really work for patient for many patients. Okay, so when working with uh, people who are patients who have poor appetite, um, takes uh, uh, a bit of time, and sometimes it is the patient and uh, the 
the, the, the relationship. Okay, so when we go in, it's not just your dietitian, you are my patient. Okay, there needs to be a relationship. Okay. Then um, other side effect during cancer treatment, for example, commonly that we see is mucositis. So they get some inflammation in the mouth, inside the mouth. So the mouth is all sore. Okay, uh, you can think about it like uh, from a perspective of like when you have mouth sore, but it's covered the entire mouth even uh, to the back of the throat. So every mouthful of food or liquids is actually very painful. So we are talking about painful eating. Okay? So when uh, eating becomes painful, uh, it deters a person to eat. For adult, they understand I need to try and eat. But for a child, when it's painful to eat, they will refuse to eat. Okay? So again, what do we do? We try and encourage, uh, um, try to work on soft foods that does not irritate the mouth. Those food like cookies, yes, it may be a favorite food, but cookies is so rough that it actually irritates the lining of the mouth. So sometimes those food, although it's a favorite food, uh, if it causes further irritation and discomfort, then that may not be the best choice. Okay. Then in such instance, because uh, many a times the intake is affected, they can't get, definitely cannot get enough, then they will need what we call oral nutrition supplements. So these are basically just like a drinks, okay, uh, that is um, contain uh, protein, vitamins, and minerals. It's something like a milkshake, but it's not made of milk, okay. The protein uh, is extracted uh, from milk, and they put it into a product and formulate it into a supplement, okay. So every bottle, for example, in adult, one bottle, you can get about 300 to 400 calories, okay, and can be easily up to 20 grams of protein. So what does this uh, look like in terms of food quantity? Eh? So if you put it into a perspective of you drink that one bottle, okay, uh, you will need to eat about five slices of bread, okay, no, four slices of bread and uh, one palm size of uh, chicken meat, like one chicken thigh. Okay, that's equivalent to like one drink. Okay, that's in adult setting. Okay, so for children, uh, there are certain oral nutrition supplements. For example, Pediasure. Okay, that is a common one that we see in children that they may need. Now, uh, in a more serious uh, case, then the child may need tube feeding. Okay, because the child needs nutrition. Okay, and they, if they can't eat orally can't get enough, then they will need to be, they need to get nutrition either through the tube, if it's appropriate. If not, then they will need to get nutrition through what we call a, a parental nutrition. That's uh, where they get the uh, nutrition through uh, intravenously. So it's like a, a clear fluid sterile one with uh, vitamins, minerals and the nutrient. And then it is infused through the bloodstream. Okay? That's parental nutrition. Now, if you have nausea, okay, if your loved one have nausea, vomiting, then what do we do? Okay, again, it's any food that can be tolerated, you know, that does not cause nausea or vomiting. Okay. Now, what we see in our patients who have cancer, uh, oftentimes, they, they are perfectly fine, but the moment they see food, they start to feel nauseous. What could be the reason? Sometimes it's the type of uh, food that they select. Okay. So the moment they uncover the food, the smell of the food makes them nauseous. Okay. So uh, depending on the uh, degree of nausea and vomiting, sometimes a cold food may be a better option. Okay. Cold, for example, sandwiches instead of a soup noodle okay. or a steamed fish that have that fishy smell. Okay. Uh, oftentimes in our patient with cancer and even in children, um, the smell of the food okay, sometimes becomes a reason that contributes to the nausea and vomiting. Okay? It's not the, the medication, but of course the medication may have that effect, okay? but not um, to the extent of smelling of the food. Okay? Uh, then with nausea and vomiting, we encourage uh, sips of fluid throughout the day. So small little amount throughout the day. So they will feel like in children, it can be very uh, taxing okay, because 
they feel like they are eating whole day. So the, the caregiver is also very stressed because caregiver have to make sure that the child uh, drink liquids throughout the day. So it's like all they do is to eat and drink whole day. And sometimes uh, this can be um, uh, cause fatigue. Okay, because the moment they associate with food, they think about the the unpleasantness that I have to go through. Okay. Okay. Then another one is um, diarrhea that can be a common uh, side effect. But sometimes these are more uh, that occur a later stage. It's not as acute as uh, nausea and vomiting. So if um, a person have diarrhea, we will then recommend a lactose-free uh, choices. Lactose-free meaning um, no dairy products, the regular ones, okay? uh, no cheese, uh, no yogurt, okay? but they can have milk that are lactose-free. That means the, the milk sugar that is called lactose that present naturally in milk is already removed. So if you go to the supermarket, you'll be able to see that there are regular milk, there are also milk that are lactose-free. Okay? So lactose-free, because um, when a person has diarrhea, okay, uh, the, sometimes the milk sugar is not easily digested. So when it passes through the uh, intestine, the colon, then uh, it will be broken down and cause a lot of gas. Okay? And with the milk sugar load, sometimes it can uh, cause diarrhea. Uh, when again, when a, a loved one, when your loved one or patient have uh, diarrhea, again, again, um, we encourage also um, nutritional supplement. Okay, because uh, whatever they eat, the next thing is they'll go to the toilet. Okay, chances are they may not be absorbing the nutrient well. So uh, this group of patient, they do need the extra so-called help. And uh, in terms of nutritional supplements. Okay? Uh, my approach with patients is always food first. Okay? We try to use uh, as much uh, natural food choices as possible and then supplement come as uh, secondary. But there are times um, these supplements become the, the first choice because they really need it. Okay? So as dietitian, we are not marketing for the company, okay? <laughs> we, we do have patients that say, oh, you come and put, try and push a supplement. It's not the case, okay? We will only recommend when it's appropriate, okay? Uh, early on, I mentioned about the parenteral nutrition. I mean, the nutrition through the intravenous, given through the blood uh, vein, okay? Uh, we see um, these cases, even in adult, that uh, because they have so much diarrhea, uh, whenever they eat anything, even when they drink liquids, the next thing is it stimulate the movement in the intestine and then they go to the toilet. So it created a lot of discomfort. So in this group of patients, uh, definitely uh, then the nutritional supplement may not be so beneficial because whatever you drink, you're going to cause even more problem. So parenteral nutrition then become the uh, so-called uh, preferred. All right, so how do we make sure uh, that while managing all these symptoms, we get enough nutrition, okay, in terms of like the protein, the calories, um, it is, it takes a lot of uh, experiments, so you are like going back to school, okay, so for me, uh, because I have to, um, I'm the caregiver for my mother who have uh, cancer, and then uh, I also have my son, when he was younger, he'd go through surgery and rehabilitation. So um, a lot of the advice uh, doesn't work for me. So it needs a lot of like experiment, trial and error, trial and error. Okay? So as caregiver, uh, it's important to note that um, as long as you uh, make that effort, okay, that is what matters. Okay? You need to make that effort. Yeah, it's a trial and error. There's no right or wrong. Okay, if it doesn't work this time round, try another way. Okay, uh, main thing is the other thing is don't give up. Okay, so in terms of protein intake. Okay, now why do we? Uh, why do I want to bring this up? Uh, bring this uh, protein intake uh, as one of the uh, key point 
of sharing today is that uh, protein is a very important nutrient okay? because we need it uh, for a normal individual, we need it to build cells and repair tissues that have been uh, damaged okay? or uh, age. Okay? But in children with cancer or, or even adults uh, with cancer, as they go through treatment, uh, the body cells get damaged faster. Okay? So when the body cells get damaged uh, faster, you need nutrient to replenish it. Okay? Other, if you don't get enough protein, you cannot build a new cell, new tissue. Okay? So protein intake is an um, important component. So for, even for our other patients okay, that go through uh, different disease stress, uh, whenever I see them, they say they have poor appetite, I don't want to eat. Our priority then is to tell them, okay, I know you, you know, um, it's unpleasant to eat, but when you can eat, okay, first thing um, in terms of uh, what to focus on to eat is the protein food first. Okay? So instead of having the soup first okay, as a meal, eat the fish or the chicken, the egg, the more nutritious choice, the protein choice first. Because if a person can eat, but they fill themselves up with a soup, Soup, yes, it gives you hydration. It's a, a liquid. It may have some a little bit of vitamins and mineral inside, but the soup itself is primarily water. Okay, there's no uh, nutrient like protein inside. Okay, so eat the protein food first. Okay, so some ways to actually uh, sneak in protein into the foods. Uh, it, it works for my um, children when they were younger. Okay, is to add milk. Or for those who are vegetarian, you can add those uh, pea powder. Okay? You can add soy powder, but soy powder has that uh, taste. Okay? It has that raw taste as compared to pea powder. Pea powder, uh, the taste is less strong. But of course, if we compare uh, milk powder or milk uh, with uh, soy protein or pea protein, the quality of protein in milk is better. Okay, but nevertheless, if it's a vegetarian, uh, pea protein, uh, soy protein, those are good choices okay, uh, from plant source. So it can be added to uh, soup, uh, mashed potato, or even to make uh, pancake, gravies, and oatmeal. Yeah, I know these are a lot of the examples that we give are like Western dishes. Okay? So what else can we do in terms of like from an Asian or more Chinese or more local cuisine is to use egg in the mixture, okay? to add egg to dishes. Okay? Um, then the other one is to um, add protein powder. Okay? This is our another um, resort. Okay? If the food or the um, using food choice okay, doesn't work uh, or when we don't get enough, we'll recommend protein powder. Okay. There are protein powder out there that are, are prescribed medically. Okay. Like for example, um, I just saw a patient of mine today who's going through uh, the uh, bone marrow transplant. Okay. Uh, she can't eat, she can eat, but she will only take soup. Okay. She'll drink the soup, she'll drink her Milo, but in terms of food, right, the only thing she can eat is uh, porridge. She doesn't want the noodle, she doesn't want the rice. And the moment she sees fish, she smells the fish, it turns her off, she gets nausea and vomiting, and that's the end of it. Okay. So what worked out uh, for us um, is that she agreed to use the protein powder. Okay. So for every scoop, for example, there's a product out there. Uh, these are more for uh, adults, but if it's in children, then we will see how much because uh, we also need to make sure that we don't overload children with protein because their requirement is different from adult. Okay? Like for my patient, the adult patient that I just mentioned, so for every scoop of protein, it gives uh, the powder, it gives about 6 grams of protein. Okay? So for her, because she doesn't eat any meat at all, she is uh, trying to eat eggs. Okay? So in order to meet her protein requirement, she will need to use 10 scoops of the protein powder. Okay. So these are uh, uh, um, 
ways we work with our patient to make sure that they get enough nutrition. Okay, okay another um, the, um, strategies that work, okay, this work for children. Okay. Um, if they like cold items, okay, uh, I know some parents uh, uh, doesn't really like it. Okay, they say, okay, cold food is not good for the body. It okay, make the body cool. And uh, so usually they say it's a no-no. Okay? But sometimes that may be the thing that can help open up the child's appetite. Okay? So we can uh, blend. Okay? If you want to use uh, whole foods, we can actually blend fruits with milk together to make it into a smoothie. Okay? Then you can freeze those uh, fruit blend and then use it, you can make it into like an ice lolly. Okay? Uh, then that can be something different than your uh, ice cream. And in fact, that can be a nutritious snack yeah, as compared to like eating a cookie. Okay? Okay. Then some other uh, ideas that are quick ones. Okay? This uh, have actually uh, worked well for me. Okay? Uh, like for example, uh, in our Chinese cuisine, if we make uh, meatball patty, okay, we can actually, um, if you want to make it more like Western dishes, we stuff some cheese inside. Okay, then uh, if it's, um, we want to make it more interesting, we stuff different ingredient inside. Uh, so I've made a dish to uh, get my child excited about eating uh, meatball patty. So what I did was that in each of the meatball patty. I put different filling. Okay, so each time they eat, eh, it's different inside. Okay, this time it's a green pea. The next bite is like a, a chicken. Okay, so different ingredients. So make it uh, interesting and fun. Okay, uh, of course, if you want to um, involve the child, okay, you can also do that. But that means they uh, already know what is inside. Okay, not so exciting already. But nevertheless, getting them involved is also uh, another good strategy. Okay, uh, then um, other ideas. I think these are not new ideas. You may come across some of these already. Like for example, uh, you may see some soybean milk store that actually sell uh, oat milk. Okay, with those uh, glutinous rice ball that comes with uh, sesame filling. Okay, so these are actually uh, good choices in terms of uh, protein snacks. Okay, uh, at home if you want to do something on your own. Okay, oatmeal we always think about oh, oatmeal. We just eat plain oatmeal, just add milk. Okay, but to make it a bit different, sometimes we can say okay, um, you can add some red beans. Okay. You can add, uh, if you want to make it savory, you can add some uh, peas, uh, sweet potato, or add, even add some uh, minced meat inside. But most of the time, people like to eat it sweet. Okay. Okay. Uh, one point I want to bring across about the smoothie, the first point here, okay, is that uh, I emphasize on freshly made and then good food hygiene practice. Okay. This is uh, more applicable to uh, patients who have cancer, okay? especially if they go through chemotherapy when their immune system is low or they go through a bone marrow transplant where they need to uh, pay attention in order not to get infection. If you recall, uh, Dr. Gopal and also Dr. Anson Lee earlier mentioned about uh, infection. It's important to not to get an infection during treatment because that can actually affect the outcome of uh, cancer treatment. So with food-wise, um, safe food handling is actually very, very important okay? uh, to keep the food fresh. Okay? So any leftover, we don't recommend leftover. Okay? Uh, if leftover is, uh, if you need to keep the leftover, then we will teach the patient how to actually uh, keep it um, overnight in a safe manner. So that means the, the food that needs to be kept for the next day use, it okay, needs to be stored in a clean container, covered, and then when it is used for the next day, it needs to be heated up to a boiling temperature. Okay, that is for cooked food. But if it's a, a frozen item like a smoothie, okay, it needs to be kept covered but used within a day. Okay, don't keep it for like one whole week. Okay, so fresh, freshly made is a better choice. 
Okay, I try to <laughs> speed up a bit, okay, because I think I'm I'm running over time and I also need to uh, rush a bit. Okay. So uh vegetable, okay, that's uh the next thing. Okay, protein is always our priority first. Okay. Then next thing, if we can get the child to eat vegetable, uh then we will uh try our effort to get them involved. Okay. Uh, a lot of time for vegetable intake, right? even in uh, children uh, without medical condition, the well children, okay? a lot of time you hear them say, e -e, I don't like vegetable. Okay? So the, the uh, good strategy is to get them involved okay? or use it as a base uh, dish. Okay? Um, like for example, the, I, I gave an example here on uh, meatball in a vegetable boat. Okay? But this one will take a bit of uh, effort and time uh, from the mummy. Okay? That means you have to go and carve your vegetable, uh, the, the capsicum shaped like a boat, okay? and then put the uh, meatball patty on it and then serve it. Uh, then uh, add all the vegetable into, uh, again, the potato patty, meat patty, or more uh, the baked dishes. Okay. Uh, just next few slides, I'll just run through very quickly. Okay. Uh, while we're talking about adequate nutrition and how to improve the diet quality, okay, uh, when a person, when your loved one is diagnosed with cancer condition, okay, um, we also get a lot of unsolicited advice. Okay? Or we may be also the culprit, like uh, you know someone who has cancer, so you start sending information. Okay? It's a well... It is well meant, but unintentionally create unnecessary stress. Okay, so a lot of times uh, in uh, patients who have cancer, okay, the they will be uh, they are told you cannot eat any food that contains sugar. Okay, so uh, because the 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 myth here is that uh, cancer cells feed on sugar. So if cancer cells feed on sugar, if you eat sugar, that means you are feeding the cancer cell. Okay, so you should not eat sugar. Um, it's not true. Okay? Even if you don't eat, uh, the cancer will still eat you, unfortunately. And it's a very sad reality. Okay? You don't eat, the cancer will continue to tap on your body for nutrition. Okay? So to fight cancer, you need good and adequate nutrition. Okay? And importantly, the treatment. Okay? The right treatment and early treatment. Okay? Um, because all cells they use uh, sugar okay, to make energy. Okay? So what's uh, a better way okay, to manage this is to eat a healthier types of uh, carbohydrate foods, okay? the whole grains, okay? and avoid the refined grains and sugar sweetened beverage. Choose the one that are more nutrient dense. Okay? Then another another one common one is that um, Eating acidic food okay, uh, make you sick. Okay, so you should only eat alkaline food. Okay. Um, from a scientific point of view, there's uh, no evidence for this. Okay. Um, although fruits and vegetables, they are mostly uh, alkaline based. Okay. So eating fruits and vegetables is a good choice because you are also getting uh, phytochemicals, those uh, cancer-fighting uh, nutrient properties. Okay. And the thing is that our body have a mechanism to balance out the acidity, okay? It doesn't mean that you drink uh, or eat anything alkaline, your body will become turned from acidic to neutral. It's not, okay? Even if you don't eat anything, okay, that means you don't go and go on an alkaline diet. Uh, your body will be able to regulate this uh, acidic balance, okay? To keep it in balance. So alkaline water is actually... Uh, not necessary, okay? Uh, in fact, if any person taking alkaline water, they just need to make sure that it doesn't affect their digestion, okay? Sometimes you overdo, you drink a lot of uh, days. I have an uh, auntie, okay? Uh, in fact, my, my relative, they are all doctors, okay? They are self-doctors, okay? Um, whenever I say one thing, right, they have a uh, hundred things to, to attack, okay, what I say. Okay, so they are doctors, so I'm just a, a normal person. Okay, so alkaline water, uh, if you do drink, okay, just make sure it does not affect your digestion. Okay, because mm. if you overdo, um, our stomach content is acidic. Okay, you need the acidity to help with digestion. Okay, 
if you go and change it, sometimes it can affect your digestive ability. Okay. Then the other one is uh, choose only organic food. Okay. Uh, is it possible to get at enough and adequate nutrition just from organic food alone? Yes, you can. But you need to be prepared to uh, spend more, okay? Because uh, organic food, although it's available, uh, some are still quite costly, okay? And you need to plan ahead on uh, what to choose, what to eat in order to get uh, that adequate nutrition, okay? But if we compare a traditional diet versus an all-organic, actually, nutritionally, there's uh, no difference in terms of the, the nutrient quantity. Okay? But if a person choose all-organic, it's fine. Okay? Because it's about reducing the exposure to pesticides. Uh, for those who uh, go with the normal choice, okay, not the organic one, to help remove the pesticide, just wash and soak with water. Okay, just now I mentioned about the food hygiene part okay, during treatment because the immune system is uh, low, okay, prone to infection. So um, in children with cancer or even uh, patients who have uh, cancer undergoing treatment with low immunity or low blood, uh, white blood cell count, uh, they need to, uh, eating raw food is absolutely no no okay, because. Uh, we want to reduce the microbial exposure, okay? Um, so food must be all cooked, except for fruits, uh, you don't cook the fruits, okay? Uh, fruits you can still eat as it is, but peel the skin, wash thoroughly, peel the skin, or choose those that are thick skin one, okay? So that there's no bruises. And then in the hospital, we use what we, we have, what we call low microbial diet, okay? Actually, this is no different from a regular diet, except that all the foods are all cooked. Okay, they don't have raw salad. Okay? The fruits that they have is only a uh, thick skin one, orange and banana. Okay? And then the dairy products are all pasteurized and then uh, no yogurt because of the uh, live uh, probiotic inside. And uh, for the nuts, uh, must be roasted, not the raw one, individually packed. So those, uh, whenever we have caregivers who want to buy food, we will tell them that you buy those that are individually packed rather than you buy those in bulk. Okay? Because in bulk, it's already all exposed. And you never know that sometimes uh, there are consumers out there when they buy food, right? They, uh, the hand a bit itchy, okay? So they stick inside to take one piece to try, then they may inadvertently touch the food inside. Okay. Okay. Then I'll just go through one more uh, FAQ. Is um, for children with cancer or patients with cancer, can they eat bakwa? Can they eat their sausage bun? Children like sausage bun, right? Okay. Uh, we don't recommend this on a regular basis because uh, processed food, I mean, it's been documented in scientific literature that uh, every 50 grams of daily intake of processed food, okay, uh, increased risk of cancer because uh, it is uh, carcinogenic, okay? So uh, not every day uh, sausage bun, okay? Not every day bakwa. If you say, okay, festive, one piece, okay. Buy those individually, pack one is better than the one in the loose, unless it's already is uh, freshly, uh, prepared and you eat on the same day. Okay. Okay, I will skip this. I'll also skip this. Okay, this is uh, if you have more questions, if you need to uh, consult us, we have a pediatric dietitian at Mount Elizabeth Novena Hospital. She's my colleague who sees uh, children cases. Okay, thank you. Sorry for uh, running over time. I also need to rush. Maybe I take one or two questions. Thank you, Ms. Go. Uh, just one question. But uh, since leukemia is the most common childhood disease, uh, what foods are good for this particular? Illness? Okay, uh, for a patient who have leukemia, because I don't work with children with leukemia, but I work with uh, adult patients who have leukemia. Okay, uh, when they go through treatment, uh, what food is good for them? Uh, first of all, we focus on protein foods. Okay, to make sure they get enough protein. So any source of protein, uh, be it uh, fish, egg, chicken, uh, pork, uh, tofu, beans, uh, lentils, uh, these are all uh, protein choice. Then the next one is uh, fruits and vegetables, the different color fruits and vegetables. So we will focus on protein, uh, the fruits and the vegetables. 
Yeah, and okay. then uh, very important, just now I mentioned about the uh, food hygiene, okay, in patients with leukemia. Because uh, for all patients with cancer, we do not want them to get infection. Yeah, another question? Okay, that's all. That's all? Okay, all right, thank, thank you. you. Uh, we invite our guest of honour, Mr. Goh, to present a token of appreciation to